Greetings everyone, and welcome to the Egregious TBC Classic Elemental Shaman PvE Guide. This video guide is based off of a written guide by the same name which was created by Egregious, and all math and theory crap is supplemented by Egregious' TBC Classic Elemental Shaman Calculator. Both the written guide and the calculator will be linked in the description below, and will be heavily referenced throughout the guide. This guide's goal is to make you the most effective and efficient Elemental Shaman possible in TBC Classic. We will be going over things like rotation, theory craft, talents, consumables, professions, anything you can think of. As with all of my video guides, you can navigate this video at your own pace using the timestamps and a pinned comment below, as well as YouTube annotations on the video itself. If anything will be changed, or if we made mistakes, make sure to check out the pinned comment for errata or errors that we made and corrections to those errors. Let's get started with the guide. First, before we get to the guide proper, I'd like to talk about the Classic Shaman Discord, which Egregious and I are co-founders of. It is a multidisciplinary collaborative home for all things Classic Shaman, regardless of the Classic expansion we're talking about. We cover both Vanilla Classic and TBC Classic. We have over 20,000 members and experienced and professional moderators and Shaman trainers that are there to help you with any questions you may have. There's discussion on spec-specific theorycraft, strategy, leveling, and play improvements. And most importantly, you can bother Egregious and myself whenever you'd like. A link to the Discord will be in the description below. Once you click on that link, you'll navigate to the README channel, and all you have to do to be part of the Discord is react to the first post with the expansion you'd like to see. There are three emojis you can react to, one for Classic Vanilla, one for Classic TBC, and one for Wrath of Lich King Classic, which of course is still under development. Of course, if you're interested in multiple expansions, you can react to as many emojis as you like, and it will open those specific parts of the Discord for you. If you plan on playing Shaman in any capacity in TBC Classic or in Vanilla Classic, I highly recommend becoming part of the Discord and part of the large Classic Shaman community we have there. Moving on to the table of contents, we'll be talking about race selection, new spells and talents, talenting itself, what is saved from Vanilla Classic going to TBC Classic, period bis, enchants, gems, stat priority and breakdown, mana management, the spells you'll be using in TBC Classic, rotations, consumables, professions, totems, add-ons and UI, key binding, group strategy, and threat. All these things will be covered in the guide and make sure to use the timestamps in the pinned comment or the YouTube annotations to navigate to the part of the guide you would like to see. Finally, let's introduce our instructor for the course, Egregious. He's a 15-year Shaman veteran and has extensive knowledge on healing in general, on Shaman and on other classes, and has cleared all vanilla and TPC content, both as elemental and restoration. He is an ex Vodka Guild member and a top US Raider, has multiple rank 1 Warcraft log parses, both in Classic and Retail, and is the co-founder, as I said before, of the Classic Shaman Discord along with myself. Most importantly, he is the author of the Egregious TBC Elemental Shaman Guide and the TBC Elemental Shaman Calculator, which are both linked in the description and which this guide is heavily based upon. And finally, Eeg is a raid logging parts lord. However, obviously, because of this guide, he is more than willing to teach new and returning players on Shaman in TBC. All right, Eeg, let's get started. Thanks, Melderon. It's good to be back. The first thing that we're going to be talking about is race selection. I would select Troll from a PvE performance perspective, as that scales the best throughout late game content. You get Berserking, which is a 3 minute CD with a 10 second duration, with a haste scale of 10 to 30% depending on your current health, and that haste is going to become far more valuable in the late game. It's a little bit rough in the early stages as you're going to be on a 3 lightning bolt chain lightning rotation, and it's going to impact what rotation you're going to be using while that's active, but in late game when you unlock your superior rotation for lightning bolt chain lightning, this will just be a direct damage upgrade in almost every single circumstance. From an early game perspective, Orc will be the superior race as the two minute blood fury cooldown is going to be a significant dps boost just because raw spell power is your most valuable stat at this point in the game however it doesn't synergize late game with things like your skull of Gul'dan or other trinkets that you might have shifting naru silver and it doesn't scale it will be a static value the entire expansion the most value that you're going to get out of orcs blood fury is when you pop it in synergy with a haste potion. While the troll racial comes with the downside that you have to be at a lower health percentage to take full advantage of the ability, the orc racial has a severe drawback of reducing the amount of healing intake you will receive while it's active. This is especially problematic in late game as the amount of raid wide damage is significant. Eek, from a PvP perspective, since troll and orc seem to be the optimal picks for elemental DPS, which one would you pick in a PvP situation? I would definitely pick orc for the stun resist. Orcs will definitely be the gladiator race. However, troll does have the wombo burst potential if you're trying to squeeze out a hyper bloodlust lightning bolt chain lightning nuke. The Torn are really not going to provide very much. You're going to get some nominal use out of war stomp in crazy hectic ad situation. A lot of things tend to be immune to stun, which is very disappointing, but there will be complex trash packs later on that you might find mileage out of war stomp. However, that's really all you're getting from the race. The endurance passive is not going to be a real game changer, nor will the nature resistance. From a PvE perspective, you are getting an extra 2.5 yards 
on your spell cast. So if you stack that with Lightning's Reach, that does have interesting implication. However, it shouldn't be too much of a game changer as the difference between the base and the upgraded range is typically sufficient. From a PvP perspective, I don't think that Torn will be a very competitive race. War Stomp, while good and has unique value in classic BGs, is just not a arena game changer. Finally, we have Draenei, which is the only choice for the Alliance. It is a very useful race from a PvE perspective for Elemental. You do get 1% hit for yourself and all of your party members within a 30 yard radius, and this is going to be significantly important from a gearing perspective, as you're going to get to save a considerable amount of stat budget in pre-raid Tier 4 and Sunwell. You're going to be a little bit over budget in Tier 5 and 6 as an Elemental Shaman, but you are providing that extra hit to your Warlocks and to your Mages. Overall, it's a very good race, and you're also getting Gift of the Naru, which is a mediocre hot that you can apply in an oh shit situation. The Shadow Resistance isn't bad either when you're in Black Temple. Let's talk about new Universal Shaman spells. The most important would definitely be Heroism Bloodlust. It's a real game changer. Your entire group, your raid even, may be designed around it. Along with that, we're getting Wrath of Air Totem, which is an incredible alternative to Wind Fury if you're in a ranged or caster group. This gives you 101 spell power to all party members and lasts for two minutes. It's essentially Wind Fury of ranged. We get Water Shield, which is an incredible self buff. It should be in its 2.4.3 state on launch, which means it will be even better than it was on TBC release. And this is basically your own personal mana consumable. You must keep it active at all time, and like Lightning Shield, it has three globes, but these will be of water instead of lightning. When triggered by damage, they will be consumed and reward 200 mana to the caster, and this spell itself, while active, generates 50 MP5. So this is something that you should keep up as often as possible, and you should focus on never letting drop. We also get Totemic Call, which is a very useful ability that allows us to recall all of the totems that we have placed currently on the ground. This will also refund 25% of the mana from each totem, and so a very cool trick here that you can do is right before your totems are about to expire, you can recall your totems in order to effectively save 25% overall. We get Fire Elemental Totem and Earth Elemental Totem, which are both of their respective element, and summon forth a pet on a 20 minute cooldown that will assist you in battle. And these pets do two different things. The Fire Elemental Totem is like an AoE damage pet, and the Earth Elemental Totem is a sort of tank alternative pet. You can use these in a raid situation. The Earth Elemental Totem will be a little bit challenging to use, as you might rip aggro from a tank or just create some unwanted movement of ad the Fire Elemental Totem should be a relatively stable totem to use. The only problem is it conflicts with one of the new elemental talents that you're going to be getting, Totem of Wrath. A Fire Elemental Totem would be a good idea to use on trash and not on bosses because the Totem of Wrath that we're going to talk about in the new elemental talents provides three crit and hit to your party members. And on 73 mobs, that 3% hit is going to be mandatory, whereas on trash, those mobs tend to be on par with your level or just slightly above, and that hit should be of less value. Fire Elemental Totem also segues into our new elemental talents. The one we were just talking about, Totem of Wrath being our primary 41 point talent in the elemental tree. This is going to be the thing that you're brought to raid for. This totem provides 3% hit and crit to all party members within 20 yards. And it's basically going to be a mandatory totem while in any caster group. Entire classes will design their gear around you. In addition, we get Unrelenting Storm, Elemental Precision, Elemental Shields, and Lightning Overload. Of those four extra talents, only Elemental Precision and Lightning Overload should be approached as mandatory from a PvE perspective. Elemental Precision increases your chance to hit with Fire, Frost, and Nature spells by 6% and reduces the threat that you cause with those same spells by 10% when fully talented. Lightning Overload, on the other hand, is probably the most flavorful talent that we get in Elemental in TBC. This talent gives your Lightning Bolt and Chain Lightning spells a 20% chance when fully talented to cast a second similar spell on the same target at no additional cost that causes half damage and no threat. This provides a similar RNG flavor to Elemental that Enhancement benefited from from Wind Fury. This gives the Elemental Shaman a little bit of that RNG slot machine mentality. Outside of Totem of Wrath, Elemental Precision, and Lightning Overload, Unrelenting Storm, while a valuable talent, is one that you're only going to be able to put about 3 points in, due to the relative competitive nature of the other points in the tree. Unrelenting Storm regenerates mana equal to 2% of your intellect every 5 seconds while casting per point, and while useful, is something that we're not going to be able to put many points in outside of Tier 5 and 6, because of the competitive nature of the other talents, and the lack of hit in gear in pre-raid Tier 4 and Sunwell. Elemental Shields, on the other hand, reduces the chance that you'll be critically hit by melee and range attacks. This is a PvP talent and has almost no function use in PvE. In addition to what's new with Elemental Talents, there's a what's changed as well. In TBC, three of our talents have changed. Elemental Focus, Lightning Mastery, and Call of Thunder. Elemental Focus used to be a 10% chance to receive a 100% mana reduction for the following spell. However, in TBC, this talent is buffed and now causes any damaging critical strikes to enter the caster into a clear casting state. In this state, the next two damaging spells will have their mana cost reduced by 40%. On paper, this seems a little bit more confusing and potentially less valuable, but in reality and in practice, this is a significant buff. Lightning Mastery used to be a 0.2 second reduction in cast time and a 
whole second with five out of five in vanilla. However, this talent has been nerfed from 0.2 to 0.1 to compensate for a cast time reduction. We're going to go more into this later in the spells and coefficients section. Call of Thunder used to be 6% crit with five out of five in vanilla and is now five with five out of five in TBC. Now that we've covered the new talents and what's changed, let's talk about a talent build. In TBC, there are not a lot of options that you can do while maintaining Totem of Wrath and five out of five in title mastery and restoration. And because it is ideal to have these two talents, the amount of flexibility you have within any potential elemental talent build is very narrow. What leeway you do have in this spec can be found in the points that are not full talents. That's Reverberation, Unrelenting Storm, and to a lesser degree, Elemental Precision. If you're in tier 5 and 6, Elemental Precision becomes slightly less valuable due to the fact that you're over hit cap and you can remove 1 to 2 points and reorganize them within the elemental tree as you see fit. However, the only leeway that you're going to have is really between Reverberation and Call of Flame. Reverberation will just be to reduce the cooldown time of your shock spells by 0.2 seconds per point, whereas Call of Flame might have unique trash implications. The reason it has trash implication and not boss implication is because on every boss fight, the mob level should be 73, whereas on trash, the mob level should be below 73, allowing you to use alternative totems to Totem of Wrath. Like you said, there's not much you can do here. All the core talents are very important to have. This talent build has all of those core talents. Like Eek said, you can move maybe a point out of reverberation, put in the Call of Flame. If you're above hit cap, you could take some of those points out and put them in an unrelenting storm to give yourself some more MP5. But remember, if you dip below hit cap, you're going to have to respect for elemental precision. Transitioning from Classic to TBC, you might be wondering what to save. There are a lot of useful pieces that you've accumulated throughout your journeys in Classic, and the majority of the most useful ones will be items from the late game with a little bit of hit and crit on them. These items are typically things like Nelth's Tear, Ring of the Fallen God, and Cloak of the Necropolis, but you may also get value out of Death's Bargain, Amulet of Vecnalash, Choker the Fire Lord, and Natural Alignment Crystal. However, two extremely solid pieces to pull from Classic would be Power of the Scourge, which is the Shoulder Enchant from Saffron, and also Save Totem of the Storm. Basically, every single one of these items will be replaced at some point. However, the Shoulder and Chan has staying power depending on how you value crit and spell power throughout all of TBC. There's one other piece from Vanilla Classic that we have to talk about, and that is the Mark of the Champion, which you receive from turning in the Phylactery of Kel'Thuzad after downing Kel'Thuzad in Nex Ramus. This trinket provides 85 spell power when fighting undead and demon enemies. And as you can tell, in TBC, there's probably going to be a lot of demons, right? The expansion's about demons, it's about the Dark Portal, but there's also a lot of undead as well, especially in Tier four when we're talking about Karazhan, and you'll find demon-esque enemies in almost every raid past that. So having this trinket in your arsenal, if you're able to get it in Vanilla Classic or during the pre-patch, or perhaps even afterwards, during TBC itself, you should definitely get it. Because this trinket will be bis in most situations when you're fighting an undead or demon enemy throughout the entirety of TBC Classic. So the following slides Eek presents here are pre-raid bis options going from the best, which means like anything you could possibly get before stepping into a raid from a profession-linked item, world bosses or content you've done in classic vanilla and as we progress through it'll get less and less stringent if you will. So the first one here we have, this is the ultimate pre-raid bis list. This is all the things you could potentially get in the game prior to stepping foot in tier four. Examples here are the Spell Strike Hood, which is from Tailoring, and Nether Strike pieces from Leatherworking. And then we have Anger Spark Gloves and Town of the Tempest, which are from World Bosses. And as you can see here, Restraint Essence of Saffron, which is of course from Saffron. This is assuming you have access to the raids in Vanilla Classic. You have access to any profession linked items and to World Bosses. The second list here is very similar to the first, but it omits any World boss gear. As you can see here, the hands are now the earth mantle hand wraps and the weapon is the gladiator's gavel and cloak of the necropolis instead of the ancient spell cloak of the highborn. So this is if you don't have access to world boss gear. For most of you out there, there will be very few guilds that have access to world bosses, so this may be a bis list that is much easier to accumulate. Third, this list includes profession linked items, but does not include world boss loot or gear from Classic. So if you're a Draenei Shaman that was not able to get into Nexramus or other raids during the pre-patch, you'll be able to get this list. And this again, of course, includes the Spell Strike Hood and Spell Strike Pants from Tailoring and Nether Strike Pieces from Leatherworking and Drops for Strain Essence of Saffron for Trinket 2 for Quagmiran's Eye, which you'll be able to get from 5-man content. And then finally, we have a pre raid Bis alternative, which includes items only from Dungeons and Rep Rewards. So this would be the easiest pre raid Bis to acquire. However, it will be the lowest output. So try to get pieces through world bosses or professions if you can, but if you don't have access to those things, this is the period best list you'll be attempting to fill out. 
In these next slides, we'll be talking about the benefit of Spellstrike Infusion versus the two available meta sockets. This is sort of a hopeful slide that Chaotic Skyfire Diamond will be in at launch. However, if it is not, Ember Skyfire Diamond will be the available option. The importance of these slides is to demonstrate the value difference between Spellstrike Infusion and the meta socket options. It's important to know that Ember Skyfire Diamond will always be worse than Spellstrike. However, Chaotic Skyfire Diamond will always be better than Spellstrike. Keep this in mind as we approach the release date of TBC and learn more about what will and will not be in at launch. The set bonus for the Spell Strike set provides Spell Strike Infusion, which gives you a chance when your harmful spells land to increase the damage of your subsequent spells and effects by 92 for 10 seconds. This effect has a 5% proc chance, and to determine the absolute value to you, you must first understand how many casts per minute you have. We can assume a maximum value of 29.44 spell power on a 3 lightning bolt chain lightning rotation. This figure is extremely generous and a non-real world figure, and a more accurate figure would be between 21 and 23 spell power, essentially on par with Nether Strike. To get an understanding of how to derive the relative spell power value of spells Strike Infusion, follow the information on this slide or in the Shaman Calculator. There are three conditions upon which you would use Ember Skyfire Diamond. One, you are not using Tailoring. Two, you have a helm with a meta socket. And three, Chaotic Skyfire Diamond is not in the game. Ember Skyfire Diamond is a very simple and straightforward 14 spell power and 2% increased intellect. This bonus scales with kings and your in pool and the value of your crit EP. In total, it's roughly 15.22 EP value. In those specific things that he pointed out, that it's early game, that KX Skyfire Diamond is not in the game yet, you do have a helm with a meta socket and you don't have tailoring, Ember Skyfire Diamond is not a bad choice. It's much more streamlined to think about as well, and it's easier to assign an EP value, and this will be your option if you meet those criteria. The final and superior option is Chaotic Skyfire Diamond. This is the late game meta gem and is assumed to be released in phase four between tier six and Sunwell. To find your inherent value of Chaotic Skyfire Diamond, you first have to know what rotation you're going to be using. And that could be three lightning bolt chain lightning or four lightning bolt chain lightning. Once you calculate Calculate the raw spell value of your rotation. You calculate relevant difference between your rotation with Chaotic Skyfire Diamond and without. So once you have your raw damage difference, you multiply that by one over the rotation coefficient times your crit, and that gives you the value of Chaotic Skyfire Diamond. This is a lot of math, and it seems very difficult to understand. However, EGS TBC Elemental Shaman Calculator does this math for you, so you can use that calculator, which is linked in the description to determine the value of Chaotic Skyfire Diamond. TLDR, Chaotic Skyfire Diamond is your optimal choice when it comes out, and you will be using it over any other meta gem. A fun fact about Chaotic Skyfire Diamond is that the actual value in terms of raw damage increase is 209% and not 203 or 206. It may seem that a 3% damage increase to your critical strike portion of your spells would only be worth 3 or 6% of your total. However, if you follow this old comment from Wowhead, you'll find that the actual value of Chaotic Skyfire Diamond is calculated slightly differently on Blizzard's end. You would first take 150, which is the average crit value, and multiply that by 103% for a total value of 154.5 total damage from a crit. You would then subtract the 100% base value, as you're only interested in the crit portion of the spell, and multiply that by 2, which is your Elemental Fury. This means that you're multiplying 54.5 by 2, for a total of 109% bonus critical strike damage, which you then add back in the base for a total value of 209% of the spell's raw damage. In TBC as in Classic, enchanting as an Elemental Shaman is very straightforward. In your headslot, you're going to be using Glyph of Power from the Shatari Revered. In your shoulder, the Greater Inscription of the Orb from Squire Exalted, or the Power of the Scourge. On your back, you'll be using Spell Penetration, Chest, Exceptional Stats, Wrists, Spell Power, Hands, Major Spell Power, Legs, Runic Spell Thread, Feet, Boar Speed, Rings, if you are an Enchanter, Spell Power, Weapon, Major Spell Power, and Shield Intellect. In addition to improving your gear through enchanting, you'll be improving your gear through the use of unique in-game items called Gems. Gemming is a new and exciting addition in TBC and are the product of Jewel Crafting, which are profession items which provide stat bonuses to gear with special sockets called Gem Sockets. Gemming is different from current retail if you have exposure to that, in that no gem socket is prismatic. Sockets are broken up into the three primary colors, red, blue, and yellow, and can be properly socketed by either a red, blue, or yellow primary gem, or a hybrid orange, green, and purple gem. Each piece of gear with sockets have a different socket bonus that can be activated only if the gems used to socket that item satisfy the prismatic color requirements. Primary gems satisfy only one color, whereas hybrid gems satisfy both of their constituent primaries. Additionally, primary gems offer a single stat bonus, while hybrid gems are a composite of their constituent primary stats. Understanding how to properly gem in TBC is important for both gaining access to your socket bonuses, as well as for working to activate the fourth and final socket type, which is the meta socket. Meta sockets are always found at the helm, and are a unique socket that may only house a meta gem. These choices include Ember Skyfire Diamond, Chaotic Skyfire Diamond, or Insightful Earthstorm Diamond. All meta gems provide additional and often unique benefits to the wearer that can only be activated through a specific gem requirement, and these gem requirements will be indicated on the gem in gray text and will turn white when the requirements are met. Something to add to this real quick is that we will go over in the next slide which gems are preferred in certain sockets 
but just remember you don't have to finish off a gem socket bonus if that socket bonus is not desired or if it's worse than if you were to gem straight a certain color gem which is primarily a red gem the only time that you have to really think about this is if one or two things one the socket bonus is something that you want and two you have to activate your meta gem as he just said so if you have to activate your meta gem you have to make sure you meet the requirements of that meta gem the way to identify which socket bonuses are of value to you is to use a site like 70 upgrades if you input personalized eps or use the base presets which are the ones that we've come up with you'll find that certain socket bonuses like three intellect have very little value in relation to stacking full spell power gems however you'll find niche value in using hybrid gems where the socket bonus is actually more valuable than socketing two of the spell damage reds in the early game which is pre-raid through tier 5 your gem selections will look something like this in your meta socket you'll be using ember skyfire diamond or insightful earthstorm diamond if you are a more conservative player and are worried about your mana constraints for red you're going to be using runed ornate ruby for your yellow you're going to be using potent ornate topaz and for your blue glowing tanzanite or lambent or vivid covered chrysoprase in the early game these epic quality gems are hard to come by and to supplement we're going to be using their blue quality alternatives these alternatives are in the red slot runed living ruby in the yellow potent noble topaz and the blue glowing night eye. For gem selections from the late to end game, we're going to be looking at them from two distinct tiers, tier 6 and Sunwell. The meta that we're going to be using at the beginning of tier 6 is Ember Skyfire Diamond until the launch of ZA in phase 4, at which point we're going to switch to Chaotic Skyfire Diamond. In our red socket, we're going to be using Rune Crimson Spinel. In our yellow socket, Potent Pyrestone. And in our blue, Glowing Shadow Song Amethyst. In the end game, which is Sunwell, our meta will be Chaotic Skyfire Diamond. Our red will be either Reckless Pyrestone or Rune Crimson Spinel, and you should be checking EP values as you gear through Sunwell to make sure that you're not over budget in haste or under budget in spell power, and your yellow will be Reckless Pyrestone and blue Glowing Shadow Song Amethyst. As we stated before, socket bonuses are not always valuable. Make sure that when you do select your socket bonuses to compare the weight in EP of the socket bonus against the potential best gems that you can apply in those sockets. To do this, you can use tools like 70 upgrades to weigh out which gems to socket and find if the available bonuses are competitive versus simply gemming your highest EP gem. We touched on Chaotic Skyfire Diamond earlier, and it's important to remember that it scales with gear. On this table to the right, we have benchmark values from supposed gear sets. At the beginning of the game, at around 30% crit with 800 spell power, Chaotic Skyfire Diamond would be worth about 44 spell power and this continues to scale as we mentioned throughout the game ending at around a value of 73.3 in sunwell with 40 percent crit and 1200 spell power or more because of this scaling nature chaotic skyfire diamond far outweighs any other option in your meta socket and should be used as soon as it's available during za's launch remember to use the elemental shaman tbc calculator to determine your actual value of chaotic skyfire diamond at your current crit and spell power allotment insightful earthstorm diamond is an option that you probably shouldn't take advantage of though you can of course use it if you do believe that you're going to experience mana problems or are uncomfortable with the mana management of an elemental shaman coming into tbc insightful earthstorm diamonds mana per five value depends on the cast time, which for Elemental Shaman is very high. On a 3 Lightning Bolt Chain Lightning, we have a, about a 32 cast per minute. It's one of the higher cast per minute in the game. IED will proc off of any spell, including totems, heals, DPS abilities, and even Water Shield. On proc, you receive 300 mana, which should be labeled as Mana Restore somewhere on Warcraft Logs. The proc is a 15 second ICD, and as a result, the gem has a 3.7% chance to proc if you are approaching it from a 2.0 cast time. However, as we know, Elemental Shaman have a varying range of cast times depending on rotation. The average 3 lightning bolt chain lightning rotation without lightning overload has about a 1.8 second cast time on average. So we would look at this table to the right of average cast times and MP5 values from Insightful Earthstorm Diamond and just line up where our cast sequence is in relation to MP5. As Zeke said, and as we're going to get into the rotation section, it's much better to become mana efficient by increasing the amount of lightning bolts you're casting in relation to the chain lightning. But if you're having a hard time with that and you're still having issues with mana, Insightful Earthstorm Diamond could be a possible selection for a meta gem. However, we don't recommend now that we've talked about gemming and enchanting, let's talk about stats. In TBC, Elemental Shaman benefit from the same primary stats of Intellect and Stamina, as well as the same secondary stats of Spell Power, Spell Crit, Spell Hit, MP5, and Spell Penetration. Though much of this is the same as Classic, the benefits of some of these stats have changed due to new talent options and Blizzard's stat overhaul. There is a final stat which, although exists in some fashion on gear early in the expansion, is heavily added to gear later with Sunwell and Black Temple. This is of course Spell Haste. Haste presents unique rotational possibilities from an elemental perspective, and presents unique challenges as well. We'll start by going over the primary stats, Intellect and Stamina. A single point of Intellect still provides the player with 15 points of mana. However, in TBC, Intellect also increases the player's MP5 by up to 10% of the total in pool when running points in Unrelenting Storm. Typically, you'll have only three. This means that Intellect also provides 0.02 through 0.1 MP5 per point, slightly increasing the overall value of the stat. Int also provides a small amount of crit per point, exactly 0.0125%. The amount of 
int needed to gain a whole point of crit has been raised from classic and now requires about 80 intellect to gain an additional 1% of crit. Overall, while intellect is an important stat for your starting mana pool, it doesn't provide significant benefit to elemental shaman when compared to the significant benefits of the secondary stats. While you should not avoid intellect, you are also not going to spend much time thinking about it. On to stamina, where a single point of stamina is worth 10 health. Although in classic it was common to select gear pieces with very low stamina and suffer very little in the way of drawback, TBC has far more lethal mechanics and making sure to have a decent pool of stamina will be of higher importance to you as you progress through the content. Moving on to the secondary stats, we'll begin with spell power. Spell power functions exactly the same as it did in classic, and to calculate how much actual damage you will receive from your spell power, follow a simple equation like the one outlined below. In this equation, you'll basically take your base min and max of a spell, divide that by 2 to get the average, and add that to the coefficient times your spell power pool. You'll then multiply this by 1.1 for lightning overload. It's important to remember that spell power isn't one to one from a spell power to damage perspective. It has to be multiplied first through your coefficient. If you want to learn more about spell coefficients and the interaction that spell power and other stats have with each other, check out the Elemental Shaman Calculator, and the link is in the description below. It's important to remember that in Tier 6, the spell power scaling of Lightning Bolt will also be increased due to the Tier 6 4 piece. Spell power is obviously a very good stat for Elemental Shaman since you are a caster. However, just remember that there are coefficients at play with both Lightning Bolt and Chain Lightning, which are your two primary damaging spells. So, as Eek said, the amount of spell power in your character sheet is not the end-all be-all. Both Lightning Bolt and Chain Lightning receive less than 100% of your spell power. You may be accustomed to using lower ranks of Lightning Bolt or Chain Lightning to stretch your mana. In TV it is important to know that a downranking penalty has been introduced to make previous ranks of spells less appealing and less effective options. This effort worked to a degree, but downranking can still be done in TBC. This penalty is calculated with this formula, assuming you are level 70. So in order to find out the downranking penalty of a certain rank of spell, you take the level at which that spell rank was available to be trained, not the level you trained it, and you add 11 to that. Then you divide by the level you are, which in this situation is level 70, to get a downranking percentage. This percentage is multiplied to the spell coefficient to get a new new spell coefficient with the downranking penalty. It is also important to realize the downranking penalty, and if a pre-level 20 penalty is applied, you would also multiply that, so they all get multiplied together. If you don't know what I'm talking about, check out the TBC Advanced Shaman Guide and I go over what I mean by that, but downranking as an element of shaman is not common, because of this downranking penalty and because you can really stretch your mana conservation in multiple ways using water shield using your talents using more lightning bolts compared to chain lightning which we'll get into in the rotation section but you shouldn't have to downrank as an elemental shaman if you want a dps but it can have some impact in some rating counters that are very long or if you're speed writing so keep in mind you can do it but the lower the rank of the spell the more downranking penalty you'll have so you may have to think about increasing a rank that you may have used in classic vanilla in tbc to get the same effect We'll move on to MP5 and crit. MP5 functions the same way that it did in Classic, where a single point of MP5 returns 12 mana every 60 seconds. Mana is returned on the energy ticker, which is every 2 seconds. However, having a significant amount of MP5 is not incredibly important in TBC, as water shield, talents, consumables, and the way crit works with elemental focus will provide the majority of your mana regen and conservation. Crit in TBC has undergone a slight change. To prevent the possible overuse of old gear going into TBC, Blizzard has switched from a whole percent to a rating system. In TBC, it will take 22.08 crit rate at level 70 to gain 1% from crit. For elemental, 1% crit doubles our spell value through elemental fury and is one of our most valuable secondary stats. The new stat spell haste is introduced broadly onto gear in tier 6 and onto gems in sunwell. It is also on the rating system and is an exceptionally good stat for elemental shaman. This stat will allow us to compress our lightning bolt cast time to the point where we would prefer to cast 4 lightning bolts ahead of our chain lightning instead of 3. This is true even before reaching a 1.5 second lightning bolt cast as at intro gear levels only around 2% haste is required to make the 4 lightning bolt chain lightning rotation superior to the three lightning bolt chain lightning unhasted version of the same. In TBC, you will gain 1% haste from 15.76 haste rating at level 70. In TBC, there are several haste breakpoints to note, all of which revolve around what rotation you are selecting. We will go into further detail on rotations in the rotation section of the guide, and as always, the haste soft cap is reached when you reduce the GCD to one second, a change that was made in patch 2.4, which should be live in classic TBC launch, as we assume the game will be released from a 2.4.3 perspective. To hit the soft cap, a value of 788 haste rating would be required, which is impossible outside of Bloodlust or Heroism and Berserking for a base 2.5 second cast time. The equation for haste is as follows. Your new cast time would be equal to your old cast time divided by 1 plus the haste rating divided by 1576. To find the amount of haste that you would need to reach a desired cast time, you would simply follow this equation, where haste rating is equal to 1576 times the desired cast time divided by the old cast time minus 1. With the gear available in the game, 
It is impossible to hit the haste soft cap without assistance from either bloodlust or heroism, and even then only while casting chain lightning. Since bumping into the haste soft cap is not an issue that Elemental contends with often, the goal of haste is instead to reduce the cast time of lightning bolt to the point where a four lightning bolt chain lightning rotation becomes superior to the base of three lightning bolt chain lightning. This means getting a very slim 25% haste rating or 1.6% haste at a thousand spell power. This is different from the collective old EJ theory crafting, which suggests that 10% haste would be required to unlock this four lightning bolt chain lightning rotation. The reason why you need so little haste to make four lightning bolt chain lightning rotation superior to three lightning bolt chain lightning rotation is because previously Letus Jerks was using the pre 2.3 haste GCD limit. Before that, the GCD was limited to 1.5 seconds. It wouldn't go below that. However, after 2.3, the GCD could be reduced down to one second, which explains why they required so much haste in order to make four lightning bolt superior to three lightning bolt chain lightning. However, assuming a 2.4.3 launch, which we know we're getting in Burning Crusade Classic, four lightning bolt chain lightning rotation will become superior to three lightning bolt chain lightning at a very low haste rating, about 25 haste rating and a thousand spell power. This relationship is contingent on spell power, and we'll get into that in the rotation section, but you require much less haste than you would have before 2.3 to make this rotation work. Thanks, Meldron. And just remember that the exact value of how much haste you're going to need for four lightning bolt chain lightning to be superior to the base rotation is dependent on the SP variable, but it's very low across the board. To the right is a small table of haste values needed to reduce both your primary damage spells cast times, and just a reminder that these are not breakpoints, simply nice round benchmarks. On to the final two secondaries of spell hit and spell penetration. Spell hit in TBC is also going to be on the rating system, where 12.58 rating is equivalent to 1% hit. For Elemental Shaman, this is going to be a very easy stat for us to budget, as our hit cap against level 73 mobs is mostly paid for. In TBC, that hit cap is 16%, and Elemental Shamans start with a baseline of 12% hit from Talents and Totems. This leaves us with an additional 4 or 3% if we're Alliance that we must cover from our gear, which is either 51 or 38 hit rating respectively. This is an incredibly easy figure to obtain, and makes hit a relatively low value stat for Elemental Shaman. Although this is true, you must obtain hit cap as quickly as possible and maintain hit cap in every situation, otherwise you will suffer a noticeable DPS loss. Hit by stat weight is by far the most valuable stat, however it is not useful to rank it in an EP system as it will produce gear sets with very odd values. Lastly, spell penetration is one of those odd stats where there is not a huge amount of information regarding how this stat works in relation to Shaman, and the community typically uses Warlock and Mage Theorycraft as guidance. As extremely few mobs or bosses have nature resistance, the consensus is to avoid this stat except for the Cloak and Champ. More information on this stat will be mined and tested in beta and in early launch. Just to add, it is a stat that is usable in PvP, and around 70 I believe is what is required to mitigate any of the self buffs that classes will have. But as Zeke said, this isn't something you're going to be stacking in PPE. Now that we understand our basic stats, we can move on to stat priority. Proper itemization is key when playing any class, and understanding how to prioritize your stats is critically important when getting the most from your character and gear. Consider this as basic early game guidance for stat priority. Hit to cap, over spell power, over crit, over haste, over int equal stam, over spell pen. An equivalency point or EP system is a better way to discuss stat weights over time, and it will be covered in the next slide and in the Shaman calculator linked in the description. Elemental Shaman stat priority begins similar to early classic and ends significantly differently. Gear having more complex stat systems, as well as the addition of new stats, makes gearing a little bit more complex in TBC than in classic and makes it harder to pick out the best possible upgrades. It is for this reason that building an EP system will be very valuable for you as a player. On the next slide will be an outline of a more accurate EP value than the traditional ones for the average Elemental Shaman. Treat these as a starting point and use them to help build your own understanding of gear. Here are my recommendations for EP derived from your rotational DPS gain from each stat, from a three lightning bolt chain lightning to a four lightning bolt chain lightning rotation. It is important to know that these EPs do not seek to include resource generation or survivability. Take this into consideration when assessing whether or not you want to add value to crit, MP5, or stam. If you do, I recommend starting MP5 at one and adding 0.2 to crit rating. For the most accurate EP information, you can visit the Shaman Calculator, the link is in the description, for more information about benchmark EPs and to test out personalized EPs for your specific stat configuration. EPs is something that he took a long time to calculate. And as you see in the table below, he separates EP values into each tier of content, PVE content specifically, tier four, tier five, tier six, and Sunwell. And as you can see, these change and shift. Intellect gets more powerful as the game progresses, as this crit, and as this haste, obviously because haste becomes more apparent in tier six and beyond. And he also puts in the value for each gem socket as well. So make sure you use his EPs and use the calculator to understand then the value of your stats on gear and when comparing what you currently wear to potential upgrades. Some notes on the elemental EPs. You may have noticed that neither hit nor spell pen are included in this, as hit is only valuable to cap and spell pen is hard to quantify. If you do include hit in a stat priority, you will get gear sets that are far over budget and hit, and this will produce a problem for you having to downgrade your selections to avoid being over budget and hit. It is also important to know that although crit is always valuable to you, 
you must scale your spell power to get the most value from crit. While all stats suffer from the inherent diminishing returns of WoW stats, where one additional point of a stat at lower gear levels is a greater percent total increase than the same at a higher gear level, the only real mistake that you can make is by stacking one while totally ignoring the other. Although there's a caveat that in the very early game, pre-raid in tier 4, it is advisable to stack spell power gems, in the later game you will want to scale your stats across the board. This means that outside of early scaling, you should try to avoid gemming pure stat gems and instead opt for hybrid crit spell power or later hay spell power gems. Additionally, you should monitor both your crit and spell power to make sure that you are not over budget in one and under budget in the other. Typically, you obtain crit and spell power between a 1% to 20 spell power ratio, and you should be consistently checking how much additional DPS a block of spell power would give you relative to 1% crit. You can manage this in real time under your personal TBC conditions in the TBC Elemental Shaman Calculator. You may also have noticed that haste rating jumps drastically in value in late game stat priority, and we will go into more detail on this in the rotation section of the guide. An aside on intellect and MP5. Both intellect and MP5 provide mana, but in opposite ways, where imp provides a static amount of mana up front, while MP5 contributes more and more the longer the encounter goes on. Additionally, the relative value of MP5 on any given encounter increases with the duration of that encounter. We can easily calculate the time that it would take for MP5 to surpass a given amount of intellect in terms of mana provided, where one intellect equals 15 mana, one MP5 will generate 15 mana in 75 seconds. If we assume a given encounter is 5 minutes or 300 seconds long, how much int would be needed to provide the same amount of mana as one MP5? In this situation, one MP5 equals 60 mana over 300 seconds, and 60 mana is equal to 4 intellect. Remember that intellect also has a few perks over MP5, where 80 intellect equals 1 spell crit, 1 int is 0.02 to 0.1 MP5, depending on how many points you have in Unrelenting Storm, and mana from int is available on demand, where you have to wait for value from MP5. Int increases your maximum mana pool and enables you to start using your consumables sooner. With a decent pool of intellect, you can afford to use your consumables in a rotation that is more efficient, and relying on static mana from int rather than a consistent stream of mana from MP5 makes it easier and less stressful to get your consumable rotation exactly on point. Finally, the more int you have, the longer you can retain a mana deficit, which allows your mana regen from both crit and MP5 to function for greater periods of time. This is more something to know than anything else, guys. So MP5, you're not really budgeting this stat in the EPs, but just know that if you have MP5 versus Intellect, you know exactly what these two things do. They both give you mana, but they do so in very, very different ways, and Intellect has some additional benefits. Just something to keep in mind when you're gearing up as an Elemental Shaman in PvE situations. We get into more practical territory on this next slide, where we discuss crit's value as MP5. With the elemental focus change in TBC, Elemental Shaman now double dip in crit, benefiting both from the damage component as well as a new MP5 component. To understand the value of crit as MP5, you first need to build out a rotation table and do a bit of simple math. This table will help us demonstrate as we walk through and can be found in the TBC Elemental Shaman calculator. So there's a lot of math here, but what Eeg is trying to show is that each percentage of crit can be thought of as a mana refund, depending on the rotation you're using. So there are many different rotations you can use in Elemental Shaman. You can use Use lightning bolt spam, three lightning bolt chain lightning, four lightning bolt chain lightning, and then you can go up from there. We'll talk about that more in the rotation section, but the more lightning bolts you use in relevance to chain lightning is more mana efficient. However, you can think about each point of crit you add, you can refund a portion of the rotational cost of performing one rotation. So in the table on the very far right hand side, the column percent per crit is basically for each percent of crit you add, you'll receive a certain portion of your rotational cost back. So for lightning bolt, that's 0.4 of your rotational cost per each percent of crit. It's 0.43 for three lightning bolt chain lightning and then 0.42 you can see as it goes on there. The MP5 equivalent is also calculated so that each percent of crit for each rotation give you the idea of how much mana per five you're refunded as you continue your rotation as you're DPSing a boss. This isn't really something that you're gonna think about while you're playing the game, but just know that crit does provide elemental shaman mana back because of elemental focus. And this math outlines how elemental focus affects each of your rotations with each new point of crit you add into your stat budget. The long and short of this math is that it is an attempt to demonstrate the idea that you should never downrank, nor should you gear for mana regen over rotational DPS increase. Now that we've talked about the different forms of mana regen, we can talk about static versus effective mana. Static mana is mana from intellect, gear, and buffs, as well as any modifiers that alter intellect's inherent value whereas effective mana is the total amount of mana you will have access to during an encounter. This comes from several sources, which include MP5, consumables, any external cooldowns like Mana Tide, Innervate, or a Shadow Priest, spirit-based 5-second rule ticks, which is something that you're probably not going to experience as an elemental shaman. Effective mana is sometimes challenging to model, but you can estimate it from the encounter time. Use this information to help you inform your gear decisions, 
consumable usage, and spell choice decisions in a live raid setting. Knowing how to gauge your effective mana pool is critical in being a well-informed player and should improve your ability to attenuate your mana usage within each encounter on the fly. The really important reason that you have to know the difference between how much mana you're going to start the encounter with and how much mana you'll have access to during the encounter is because it really allows you to time your consumables better and it allows you to have a better grasp on how much active time you have, allowing you to use a more damaging rotation over a less damaging rotation in an attempt to save mana. We'll move on now from stats to our primary spells. Elemental Shaman have one of the most straightforward damage kits in TPC. We are comprised of three main abilities and several other niche support abilities, and learning the ins and outs of this spec should present less of a challenge to newer and more experienced players alike. Let's begin by going over our primary damaging abilities. The first is Lightning Bolt, our main damaging ability and the cornerstone of any of our rotations. In TBC, this ability receives a slight nerf relative to where it was in Classic. This is due to the reduction in cast time, which is designed to support the rest of Shaman Outworld farming. The base cast time dropped from 3 to 2.5 seconds. However, the effective cast time has remained the same due to a nerf to Lightning Mastery. This means that the coefficient of Lightning Bolt would be 2.5 divided by 3.5, down from 3 divided by 3.5, for an average value of 71.4 instead of 85.7%. To compensate for this, Blizzard buffed Lightning Bolt's coefficient to 79.5%, and fortunately, Elemental Shaman also received a new talent in the form of Lightning Overload, which when fully talented grants a 20% chance that our lightning spells will be duplicated at no additional cost for half value. This effectively multiplies our coefficient by 1.1 for a new value of 87.5%. Keep in mind that this is not the actual coefficient value, rather a way to think about the interaction between lightning overload and the spell. Lightning overload scales the entire spell and is better than simply scaling the coefficient, and additionally, concussion does not scale the coefficient, but rather the base min max of the spell. Lightning Overload's increased damage seems like a full compensation until you realize that Blizzard spent our tier 8 talents in order to bring us back to par with the classic version of ourselves. Though upon realization this feels bad, it is actually slightly better than it seems, as LO also buffs not only the coefficient but the base min-max of the spell. This is because the entire spell is duplicated, which considers the coefficient as well as the base min-max when generating the spell's specific value. All this aside, Lightning Bolt is still our most mana efficient spell, and costs 300 mana untalented and 270 mana talented. Lightning Bolt will comprise a majority of your damaging spells and will be your go-to for stretching your mana conservation in situations where you need more mana. In Tier 6, it's also important to remember that we receive an additional bonus to the raw damage dealt by Lightning Bolt. Our second primary spell, and the end of our rotation, is Chain Lightning. This spell is essentially both our cleave and nuke ability wrapped into one, and is on a 6 second cooldown. Although Chain Lightning is expensive, over twice the cost of Lightning Bolt, it is the second half of our highest DPS rotation. This spell is on a 1.5 second cast, the same as the GCD. However, assuming Blizzard launches the game from a 2.4.3 framework, Haze will scale both the spell and will scale specifically the GCD to a minimum of 1 second. This spell also receives a slight nerf coming into TBC, similar to Lightning Bolt. The base cast time has been reduced from 2.5 to 2 seconds, which nerfed the coefficient from 2.5 divided by 3.5 equals 71.4% to 2 divided by 3.5 or 57.1%. Blizzard again compensated by buffing the coefficient to 64.3, which is again still a nerf compared to its original value. However, we are compensated for this through Lightning Overload again, which readjusts the value to around 71%. Keep in mind that like Lightning Bolt, this isn't the actual coefficient. The goal of Chain Lightning as a spell is to use it off cooldown even if there are no mobs for it to jump to. This can present challenges in situations where mana is a factor. However, while under mana constraints, it will be your goal to attend the number of chain lightnings you use and not run yourself oom during an encounter. We will go into more information on the utilization of this spell in the rotation section of the guide. Keep in mind that this spell has the possibility of generating a significant amount of threat and it is unwise to use this spell on pull. Our next spell is our cooldown elemental mastery. This is our main DPS cooldown and guarantees that the next fire, frost, or nature spell that you cast will crit and be free of mana cost. This is a very straightforward spell and is not game changing. Use this in conjunction with chain lightning when elemental focus is not active. With the removal of batching and TBC, it should no longer be possible for this ability to receive receive value from two spells. Think of this as a straight damage boost to Chain Lightning, and learn to pop it early to get multiple uses, or use it in conjunction with either an on-use or proc-based spell power trinket. As you said, this will not lead to the batching, you know, Chain Lightning Earthshot combos you see in PvP a lot, and in PvE and Classic Vanilla. Also, you don't want to be too close to a boss. Remember, a shock range is 20 yards. This is much better used as a on-cooldown boost to Chain Lightning. You should use it on Chain Lightning over Lightning Bolt because, number one, Chain Lightning usually does more damage, depending on your spell power. Power, but the biggest factor is, is that Chain Lightning is a much higher cost than Lightning Bolt, so using it for Chain Lightning is a higher impact on your mana conservation as well. 
This brings us to the supplementary section of our primary spells. We'll begin with Flame Shock, which is a somewhat lackluster ability and has two components, a front-end fire damage component and a back-end fire dot, lasting 12 seconds. Like all of our shocks, it is an instant cast ability. However, it has a slightly different coefficient due to the dots component of the spell. Flame Shock's coefficient is 15%, with an additional 13% for each tick of the dot, or a total of 67%. Over the 12-second duration of the dot, there are four ticks of damage, and this number does not change with haste, as haste does not affect dots in TVC. The spell is not attractive from a rotational standpoint and should really only be used during periods of movement. It's also worth noting that this ability will take up a debuff slot on whatever mob or boss it affects, and that may not be something positive for your raid. Now we'll talk about your AoE damage fire totems. We'll begin with Fire Nova Totem. This is a fun but challenging ability to use. This ability places a totem on the ground near the caster that will detonate after 5 seconds. This ability causes a significant amount of fire damage in a 10 yards radius and has a 15 second cooldown. The coefficient for this spell is similar to other instant cast spells and starts at a base of 21.4%. This ability can be scaled with a talent call of fire up to a coefficient of 24.6%. Meldron, however, has done some testing on private servers and found a slightly higher value of around 27.6%. This is consistent with other testing from Classic, which seems to indicate that this ability may have a higher coefficient scaled with Call of Flame. This ability will be updated to reflect beta and early Classic TBC testing numbers. The reason this ability is challenging to use is due to its nature as a fire totem. Because it is a fire totem, it shares its position with Totem of Wrath, which in most situations is a vastly superior totem. It will be unlikely that you will not be using Totem of Wrath during a boss encounter, as you and your party members will likely depend on the hit offered by Totem of Wrath for level 73 mobs. Removing this totem on boss encounters will likely do more harm than good. Having said that, on trash or in dungeons, you can expect to see much more use of this ability. Non-level 73 mobs don't require a 16% hit cap, and so most trash falls into this category of sub-level 73 mobs. You should still have a discussion with your fellow group members about whether they would prefer to keep the crit for AoEing, but as a trash rotation, including Fire Nova Totem and our next totem, may be more prudent than simply keeping Totem of Wrath down 100% of the time. This segues to Magma Totem. Magma Totem is the second portion of our AoE DPS fire rotation. This ability places a fire totem near the caster that pulses every 2 seconds, causing low level fire damage in an 8 yard radius and lasting for 21 seconds. This spell is an instant cast and has a very low coefficient. Magma Totem's coefficient is a slim 6.7%, a buff from Classic's original 3.8. This ability also benefits from Call of Flame and can reach a coefficient of around 7.7%. The goal of this totem is to supplement the downtime during Fire Nova Totem's cooldown. Make sure that when you use this totem that there are enough mobs in the vicinity to justify the CD. If there are too few mobs, you would have been better served by simply casting an extra lightning bolt. The amount of mobs needed to justify the worth of Magma Totem is only around 3 to 4 mobs. Additionally, as with Fire Nova Totem, make sure that your group is not suffering a hit drawback on whatever mobs you are attacking, or that the 3% crit would not be more valuable than the supplemental damage from Magma Totem. Finally, we have Fire Elemental Totem. This is the final element of your Totem AoE DPS rotation. This ability places a Fire Totem on the ground near the caster for 2 minutes and summons a Fire Elemental. This Fire Elemental acts as a pet of the caster and will defend the caster, attacking any mobs they are in combat with. This ability has a 20 minute cooldown, and this totem is a great boost to AoE damage and should be used off cooldown as much as possible in AoE trash situations. Finally, we'll talk about our two utility spells, Earthshock and Water Shield. Earthshock in TBC rating, as in Classic, is not a DPS ability per se, but rather a utility tool. You should have rank 1 and max rank on your bars for the purposes of interrupting any vulnerable mechanics during an encounter. What rank you choose will depend on how much mana you can afford, and how much damage you want to do at the same time. Remember that Earthshock at max rank has a 40% spell coefficient, and also remember that Earthshock has had its threat component removed and generates threat at a 1 to 1 ratio in TBC. The threat component was added to Frost Shock, and keep that in mind when utilizing that spell. And finally, Water Shield. Get into the habit of refreshing Water Shield all the time. This is a critical ability that must be active on you at all times while in a PvE scenario, period. I commonly watch Shaman VODs or review my own, and one of the first things that I notice is when Water Shield falls off and is not refreshed for a length of time. I would suggest getting an add-on such as Totem Timers or Shields Up to track this, or alternatively, to create your own weak aura that spams you every time this ability falls off. A great habit to get into TBC is refreshing Water Shield at every time you reposition or every time that you have a spare GCD. Remember that Water Shield rank 2 provides 50 mana while active, and if that weren't stupid enough on its own, it also restores 200 mana every time a charge is consumed. Charges will be consumed the same way that Lightning Shield charges are consumed, by any direct damage, cleave, frontal cones, tail swipes, AoE, and even some damaging auras. As it requires no mana at the cast, and it does not trigger the 5 second rule, there is literally no drawback in expending a global cooldown on refreshing this critical ability. Finally, this ability counts as a successful spell cast, and has a chance to proc Insightful Earthstorm Diamond if you have made the choice to run that specific meta gem. Before we get to the rotation, slides, let's talk about the reasons why you should not downrank as an elemental shaman. In TBC as in classic, downranking 
is the use of lower rank spells in an attempt to stretch your mana resource over a long period of time. However, unlike in Classic, Elemental Shaman have received much needed boosts to resource regeneration through the addition of Water Shield and the buffs we've received to Elemental Focus. These buffs make Elemental's mana management significantly better and reduce the need to downrank. In fact, the best way to manage your mana is by attenuating the number of lightning bolts that you're going to be using between every chain lightning. This table that we've referenced earlier now has a new component and demonstrates the relationship between 1% crit versus an additional lightning bolt in your rotation as MP5 or as a disc count or refund to your rotation, however you prefer to think about it. You'll notice that the value for crit in terms of MP5 and as a discount to your rotation is relatively small compared to the savings from an additional lightning bolt in your rotation. This table demonstrates that it would take 15.9% crit to match the resource benefit from adding a single lightning bolt to a three lightning bolt chain lightning rotation. TLDR here, guys, is that downranking is inferior to adding a single lightning bolt to your rotation as far as mana conservation is concerned or adding a bunch of crit. There's one of two ways you can increase your mana conservation as Elemental Shaman outside of downranking. One of them is to add crit and then hope for Elemental Focus procs. And, and an easier, more superior way to do it to increase your mana conservation is to just add a lightning bolt to your rotation. So if you're casting four lightning bolt, one chain lightning, and you're noticing you're not finishing the fight, you're popping your consumes, you have all your abilities, you're using demonic runes, all those things and you're still not getting to the end of the fight just add a lightning bolt that will stop you from having to downrank and will maximize your dps for the entire window of the boss encounter it's important to know that you also don't have to stick to a, a five lightning bolt chain lightning rotation if you're adding a lightning bolt to increase your mana conservation you could be running a three lightning bolt chain lightning rotation five times in a row and then do a four lightning bolt chain lightning rotation swapping back to three the same could be true if you want to stretch a little bit of your mana in a four lightning bolt chain lightning rotation where you simply, after four or five iterations of the rotation, add a five lightning bolt chain lightning. The methods to attenuate your mana are literally infinite from a rotational perspective, and don't feel that you have to get pigeonholed into utilizing either one rotation or another. You can switch back and forth between them freely. It's okay to play around with your rotation during an encounter until you have a stable encounter time that your guild is able to achieve from week to week. Now we can move on to the fun part of the guide, rotations. Elemental Shaman have one of the least difficult rotations in TPC. While this is true, there is still a broad ability gap among Shaman players and nuance regarding what rotation and abilities to utilize. Spell power, haste, and encounter duration are all three metrics that will dictate for us which rotation we should or will want to use as an Elemental Shaman while in endgame environments. Something I'd like to add before we get into the rotation section proper. Keep in mind that rotation selection is a dynamic process you will see that we present different rotations as if those are the only options to choose when you're DPSing as an Elemental Shaman. However, it's better to think about these rotations as possible options as you move through a raid. Each boss encounter, especially during progression, may have significantly different fight lengths, and therefore, thinking about mana conservation will become more important. Although three lightning bolt, one chain lightning is the highest DPS before we have enough haste to upgrade to a four lightning bolt chain lightning rotation, adding more lightning bolts in relation to chain lightning is the way you're going to stretch your mana and longer encounters, even before haste. After we have enough haste, which is approximately between 1% and 2%, depending on your spell power, 4 Lightning Bolt Chain Lightning actually does more damage than 3 Lightning Bolt Chain Lightning and is more mana efficient. So haste unlocks both mana efficiency for us and higher DPS. But a significant portion of the game, we won't have enough haste to actually upgrade to 4 Lightning Bolt Chain Lightning from a DPS-only perspective. Despite this, you should tailor your rotation to your fight length and your guild's ability. As you progress through raids and become more confident and are potentially on farm status, you can move to the highest DPS rotation while while not worrying as much about your mana conservation. An easy way to think about this is, if you need to stretch your mana, add more lightning bolts in relation to chain lightning, potentially even lightning bolt spam for very, very long encounters, which is your most mana efficient rotation. And as fight lengths get shorter and you get more confident as a guild, you can decrease the amount of lightning bolts per chain lightning to maximize your DPS. Again, this is a dynamic process and you can switch between rotations during an encounter to maximize your mana efficiency and your DPS. The goal is to produce as much DPS as possible while having enough mana to get through the fight. Just remember to use your consumables like mana potions and dark and demonic runes, use mana spring totem, and never let water shield drop. We'll begin with the standard rotation of three lightning bolt chain lightning. This will be your primary and highest DPS rotation until we unlock haste on gear in tier 6. It is a very simple rotation that revolves around fitting three lightning bolts in the six second chain lightning CD window. The entire rotation consists of only four spells and takes seven and a half seconds to complete. Three lightning bolt chain lightning is anywhere between six to nine percent better than a simple unhasted lightning bolt spam before tier six four piece. It is important to use your elemental mastery in this rotation on a chain lightning cast when you do not have elemental focus active. You can also macro on use trinkets to chain lightning as you're considering chain lightning to be the beginning of your rotation. To find this rotation's DPS, you can use tools like the TBC Elemental Shaman Calculator linked in the description 
description below. This segues into our next rotation, 4 Lightning Bolt Chain Lightning. This is the upgraded version of 3 Lightning Bolt Chain Lightning and can be unlocked assuming 2.3.0 GCD hay scaling at a value of around 20 to 25 haste rating, or around 1.27 to 1.59% haste. The exact rating requirement will differ slightly from each player as it depends on your spell power, and you can test for the exact value for your specific stats on the TBC Elemental Shaman calculator. This rotation essentially adds an extra Lightning Bolt despite Chain Lightning being off cooldown, and will consist of 5 spells, 4 Lightning Bolts, and 1 Chain Lightning. The amount of time that this rotation will take to execute will depend on your haste rating. 4 LBCL will always be better than a simple lightning bolt spam, and it scales to be dramatically better than 3 lightning bolt chain lightning the more haste you have. Not only does this rotation do more damage than 3 lightning bolt chain lightning once it is unlocked, but it also is more cost effective as well. As with 3 lightning bolt chain lightning, it is ideal to use your elemental mastery and trinkets in this rotation on a chain lightning cast when you do not have elemental focus active. You can macro your on use trinkets to CL as you can consider it to be the beginning of your rotation. To find this rotation's DPS, you can assess the TBC elemental shaman calculator. We'll move on to your mana conservation rotation. This is four or more lightning bolts and chain lightning. This rotation refers to any number of possible lightning bolt chain lightning rotations with five or more lightning bolts. There is no set number of lightning bolts required to run this rotation as the goal of this rotation is to increase the longevity within an encounter by improving your mana conservation. Each additional lightning bolt will provide a greater amount of mana saved and lengthen your time to oom by that much more. Technically the first additional lightning bolt is the fourth which reduces your overall rotation relative to three lightning bolt chain lightning by 6.79% and total cost. The subsequent lightning bolt from 4 to 5 reduces the cost of your rotation by 11.21% relative to the base 3 lightning bolt chain lightning. Every time you add another lightning bolt after that, your rotation will cost less than the base, but the percent decrease diminishes logarithmically relative to the lightning bolt before. The table below illustrates that relationship, where the first additional lightning bolt has a discount of 6.79, the second 11.21, and the third 14.32. This continues on infinitely until you would not have cast a single chain lightning. Use this scalable rotation in situations that you feel you will oom before the encounter ends or are unfamiliar with a new encounter to avoid ooming while you learn. The goal of a good elemental shaman will be to intuitively adjust your mana consumption on the fly within the needs of each encounter. The most resource effective rotation is simply the lightning bolt spam. This is our simplest rotation and most mana efficient. If you are new to an encounter, unsure of how long an encounter may be, or new to shaman, it can be prudent to begin your first few pulls with lightning bolt spam until you get a feel for the mana requirements. Lightning bolt spam consists of only one spell and has a rotation of the current cast time of lightning bolt. Unhasted, this rotation does anywhere between 5 to 9% less damage than 3 lightning bolt chain lightning, with the benefit of being extremely straightforward. This humble rotation outstrips 3 lightning bolt chain lightning's DPS between 7 and 8% haste, depending on your spell power, and although you can use your trinkets at any time during this rotation, you should do your best to line them up with other CDs. To find this rotation's DPS, you would again consult the TBC Elemental Shaman Calculator. So Agrees has outlined all of those rotations in the previous slides. What these graphs show are rotation comparisons as certain spell power benchmarks. On the x-axis, we have haste going from 0 to 15%, and on the y-axis, it's just raw DPS. So at zero spell power, which isn't really possible in TBC, once you hit level 70, you'll have some spell power. You'll have actually a good amount of spell power. You can see the lightning bolt spam is the pink line, three lightning bolt, one chain lightning is the green line, four lightning bolt, one chain lightning is orange, and five lightning bolt, one chain lightning is blue. And as you can see, as soon as you start to accumulate haste, lightning bolt spam, four LB, one CL, and five LB, one CL all start to scale up. This is because three lightning bolt, one chain lightning is inherently not scalable with haste because you'll have to wait for that chain lightning to come off cooldown. So as you accumulate haste, you should not use three lightning bolt, one chain lightning because you literally have dead time in your rotation. This is why the other rotations scale and the green line does not. So even at zero spell power, at approximately three to four percent haste, four lightning bolt one chain lightning and five lightning bolt one chain lightning rotations out DPS. At higher percents of haste, around 14 or 15 percent haste, even lightning bolt spam outstrips three lightning bolt one chain lightning. But as you increase spell power, as we see on the next slide, with 750 spell power, that relationship shifts to the left. So you'll need less haste to outcompete three lightning bolt one chain lightning rotation. Here we see lightning bolt spam outcompetes around eight percent haste, while four lightning bolt one chain lightning and five lightning bolt one chain lightning start to outcompete as early as 1.5% haste. And as you increase spell power, here's a thousand spell power, that relationship moves even further to the left, and at 1,205 spell power, which is approximately what you'll reach at endgame in Sunwell, we can see you need even less haste. What these graphs are showing you is that as you increase spell power, you need less and less haste to really eclipse three lightning bolt one chain lightning. At higher spell power, between one and two percent haste, you can start using your four lightning bolt one chain lightning or five lightning bolt one chain lightning, depending on your mana conservation, and you can even outscale three lightning bolt one chain lightning with 
with lightning bolt spam if you needed to if fights are extremely long and your guild is having a little bit of hard time progressing so in this slide is just a table showing you exactly how much haste you'll need to eclipse three lightning bolt one chain lightning and it's pretty straightforward in addition to spell power here we also have spell crit which is scaling in a way we think will scale with gear as you accumulate it throughout tbc classic and each row is a spell power crit benchmark if you will and how much haste you'll need to eclipse three lightning bolt one chain lightning at 750 to 824 spell power and 25 to 27.2 percent crit which is we consider the baseline what you'll have access to is a fresh level 70 they'll need 1.6 percent haste to eclipse three lightning bolt one chain lightning and at end game with 1149 to 1250 spell power and with about 37 to 40 percent crit you'll need 1.34 percent haste that isn't a big window so again what we're trying to hammer home here is that you don't need a lot of haste for four lightning bolt one chain lightning to be superior to three lightning bolt one chain lightning this is also true of the other iterations as well the other scalable rotations of four plus lightning bolt one chain lightning you'll need very small amounts of haste to make those rotations superior to three lightning bolt one chain lightning the only one that kind of is on its own is lightning bolt spam you need a bit more haste to make that superior but you'll definitely reach that haste breakpoint by black temple gearing the final rotation is a more hypothetical rotation and is the fabled old school best dps rotation this is the five lightning bolt two chain lightning and flame shock rotation this rotation fits five lightning bolts and a flame shock in between two chain lightnings there are several issues with this rotation first it has an inherent 0.5 seconds of dead time two it like three lightning bolt chain lightning is inherently capped and cannot benefit from haste finally and most importantly flame shock does not benefit from lightning overload on its front end nor does it benefit from crit during the dot portion the rotation would go something like this flame shock chain lightning lightning bolt lightning bolt lightning bolt chain lightning lightning bolt lightning bolt flame shock chain lightning lightning bolt rinse repeat as you can see as we hit the flame shock chain lightning at the very end of the rotation you encounter 0.5 seconds of dead time all the pitfalls of this rotation aside the major reason that this is an inferior rotation to three lightning bolt chain lightning or the latter four lightning bolt chain lightning is due to flame shocks damage per cast being natively lower than lightning bolt also flame shock requires a 20 yard range making it challenging to utilize effectively on paper looking only at the raw damage values of spells before interactions with crit lightning overload and other damage modifiers flame shock seems to have a higher dps value however once factoring all talents and stat modifiers this is not the case if flame shock were to have a higher damage per cast value than a single lightning bolt this would be incorporated into our rotation this is not to say that you will never use flame shock in your rotation flame shock is a useful spell if you are moving or displaced remember to use this spell and also refresh water shield in any period of time that you might have movement and remember not to overstack a debuff slot on a priority target like a boss and push an important debuff off with flame shock in those situations it might be better to use earth shock or frost shock outside of your primary dps rotations on bosses there exists also a trash rotation which you can think of as fire totem twisting on trash and in dungeons where the level 73 mob hit cap is not required it could be a potential DPS increase, twist Fire Nova Totem and Magma Totem in place of Totem of Wrath. This is your AoE rotation and not a single target. So if there's a priority kill target in a pack, you will stick to whichever Lightning Bolt Chain Lightning rotation is optimal at your gear level. However, if there are many adds and no priority kill targets exist, then you can use Fire Nova Totem and Magma Totem to supplement your AoE damage. In a rotation like this, your goal would still be to chain lightning off cooldown while keeping Fire Nova Totem on cooldown as frequently as possible. You would then fill the Fire Nova Totem cooldown time with a Magma Totem and Lightning Bolt Spam. Keep in mind that Magma Totem needs around three active targets to be equivalent to the GCD trade for a Lightning Bolt. Use Magma Totem to supplement your trash DPS only in situations with a modest number of mobs. Otherwise, stick to Lightning Bolt Chain Lightning and Fire Nova Totem. Finally, remember to deploy your Fire Elemental Totem on cooldown when on trash. You can utilize this totem only once every 20 minutes, but it is worth the GCD. The rotation should look something like Chain Lightning, Fire Nova Totem, Magma, Lightning Bolt, Lightning Bolt, Chain Lightning, Lightning Bolt, Lightning Bolt, Lightning Bolt, Chain Lightning, Rinse, Repeat. Note that this will change minorly with the jump from 3 lightning bolt to 4 lightning bolt chain lightning. Now that we have our rotation down, it's time to turn our attention to consumables. In TBC, your baseline consumables will look something like this. A couple flasks of blinding light, destruction potions, super mana potions, superior wizard oil, blackened basilisk, haste potions, darker demonic runes, and chain of the twilight owl and eye of the night. These two unique JC crafted necks are considered consumables as they both have 10 charges and can be rotated with another participating party member to receive both buffs simultaneously. These two necks provide unique buffs where chain of the twilight owl on use increases the spell critical strength chance of nearby party members by 2% for 30 minutes. Eye of the Night, on the other hand, increases the spell damage by up to 34 for all nearby party members and lasts for 30 minutes. These two buffs can only remain active while the wearer has the neck responsible for the buff equipped. This is why you will need two players in your party to make use of this consumable rotation. And even though these are jewel crafting pieces, jewel crafting is not required and they are both bind on equip. 
Your supplementary consumables will be Flask of Supreme Power, Major Mana Potions, any sort of resistance protection potion, and Drums of Battle if you are a leather worker. We know by now that drums are going to be shifted and altered in some way in TBC Classic. They said they were going to alter them, possibly nerf them, or make them unlinked to the leather working, or provide some kind of a cooldown associated with them. However, it is still important if you are the designated person to use these drums in your group to have drums of battle with you when you go into a raid setting. Now that you have your consumables down, let's take a look at the unique benefits provided by professions. In the early game, we have alchemy offering alchemist stone, enchanting, enchant ring spell power, engineering only various bombs and assorted goodies, as it's assumed that the helms will not be on launch, jewel crafting, Don Julio's heart and other crafted gems, leatherworking, drums of battle, nether strike or windhawk sets, and tailoring the spell strike set. In the late game, these change to alchemy offering sorcerer's alchemist stone, enchanting the same enchant ring spell power, engineering lightning etched specs, jewel crafting Don Julio's heart and the pendant of sunfire, leatherworking only offering drums of battle, and tailoring offering the best in slot sunfire robe. While nearly all of these professions offer something useful, in one way or another, to the elemental shaman, the professions that you will most concern yourself with are leatherworking, jewel crafting, and tailoring. Of these, leatherworking is by far the most valuable profession to have in the early game, and holds its value throughout the game due to drums of battle. Your second profession should be tailoring to unlock the spell strike infusion set bonus. To run the ideal tier 4 2 piece, you will lose access to the spell strike set bonus as the helm is replaced. However, you can work around this to maintain both nether strike and spell strike set bonuses into tier 5 while running tier 4 2 piece. In the early game, Game, leatherworking offers both Nether Strike and Windhawk sets. Nether Strike requires the Dragon Scale Leatherworking, and Windhawk requires Tribal. Tailoring is a close second and offers the unique Spell Strike set bonus, which is Spell Strike Infusion. While you do not have to be a tailor to equip either of the Spell Strike pieces, you must in order to benefit from the set bonus. The only issue with the Spell Strike set is that it does not hold up well into Tier 4, even if Engineering is not in the game. This is because you will want to maintain the Nether Strike set bonus, and the second best piece of Tier 4 that you want to pick up would become the Helm. This breaks Spell Strike and marginalizes its value in the early game. In conclusion, running Leatherworking and Tailoring has the best early game value for pre raid and Tier 4 bis. If you want to get super ridiculous with professions in TBC, eking out every last ounce of performance, you certainly can. Before you pick up any crafting profession, you would begin with enchanting and jewel crafting. You would ideally farm as much bis as you can, and then enchant your rings and craft your JC only gem and socket it. Then you would drop both professions and pick up your two. Two desired crafting professions, leatherworking and tailoring, and craft those pieces. While possible, the expenses of this min-maxing effort are immense and may only be attractive to the biggest tryhards and the sweatiest of neckbeards. As a DPS, the goal of any of your profession cycles is to ideally end on leatherworking, in order to continuously use drums of battle in your raid environment. If you choose to engage in a profession cycle in the early game, it will look something like this. Jewel crafting as your first profession, which you'll then drop as you socket a piece of gear with longevity. Enchanting as your profession 2, which you will then drop once you obtain your pre-raid bis rings. Leatherworking as your replacement profession 1, which you will then hold. And tailoring as your profession 2, if you want to run the spell strike set, otherwise you would keep enchanting. As you progress from tier 5 through tier 6 and into Sunwell, you should have replaced all of your crafted gear with the superior tier 6 options. At this stage in the game, you should be prepping for Sunwell, and jewel crafting and leatherworking will become the most impactful professions in the game. The runners up here are tailoring, engineering, and alchemy. Tailoring offers the best in slot Sunfire Robe, which holds a modest lead over Garments of the Crashing Shores. However, at a slim lead over the Muru Chest, Drums of Battle should have a competitive lead. Engineering also offers Lightning Etched Specs, which, while powerful relative to tier 6, will only have impact for the first week or two of Sunwell before you have it on farm. If you plan to be in Sunwell, for a while, then this may be a prudent option, but if you're expecting to clear Sunwell without much difficulty, you might want to skip engineering. Alchemy will offer the Sorcerer's Alchemist Stone, which, while great, has its worth contingent upon the need for mana. This may sound silly, but as we've covered in the Crit as Mana section, if you don't need mana, then you don't need this trinket. It's hard to say for certain what mana needs will be like going into Sunwell while we're here sitting at pre-launch, and we'll be monitoring the game to determine what value this trinket has the closer we get to Sunwell's release, and we will amend this section with our findings. The two highest impact professions, assuming the above is true, will then be Jewel Crafting and leatherworking. Jewelcrafting offers Pendant of Sunfire, which is head and shoulders the best neck offered in the game, and leatherworking, while offering no bis crafted gear, has its staple Drums of Battle, which provide competitively the most advantage. These two professions will be the ideal combo if you're not looking for early tier value from engineering, or if you think that the modest EP value increase in the JC neck is worth more than the resource component of Sorcerer's Alchemist Stone. Picking only two professions should be fine. However, you can again go through a profession cycle to get every last ounce of benefit. Remember that before Sunwell, you get what are essentially your bis rings. You can get extra value here by cycling enchanting in advance to get both of your rings of ancient knowledge their 12 spell power damage enchant, one of which remains bis in Sunwell. A clear-cut profession rotation for elemental transitioning from Black Temple into Sunwell is challenging to pin down precisely, and will depend on what gear you're going for and whether or not you want to keep drums of battle. Your profession cycle will look something like this. You begin with enchanting in your profession one slot 
in Black Temple to enchant your rings. You drop enchanting and pick up engineering in your profession one slot if you're interested in getting the intro value out of the goggles. If not, then alchemy would work here if you're concerned with mana. You would then get your profession two as leatherworking and keep it if you already had it from the early game and then swap your profession one to jewel crafting after you drop engineering once you've replaced the goggles. Once you are full bis and you have gotten your ring of omnipotence, you can, if you choose, drop a profession for a week, pick up enchanting again, and enchant that ring. This may not be the most practical use of gold, as we can expect to be saving for classic wrath, but it may be an attractive option to some. This next section will cover something unique to shaman, our totems. If you are new to the idea of placing buff sticks, your group can help you learn to refresh totems in a timely fashion and manage their short range. I advise you to notify your group to spam a macro and party your chat once they notice a chair of buff has fallen off. A buff-hungry DPSer should be all too eager to assist you with this. Get in the habit of thinking about your totems and their position relative to your party members. Remember that your party members must be within 20 to 30 yards of the totem, depending on your spec, to receive a benefit from that totem. You can improve your totem play with the following considerations. By keybinding your totems, by downloading a totem timer, by considering totem utility, which is making sure that you use the optimal totem for each element in each each situation. And finally, by totem twisting, a tactic that is widely used by Enhancement Shaman in TBC and refers primarily to replacing Wind Fury with Grace of Air Totem while maintaining both buffs at the same time. However, can be thought of as any sort of replacement of the same totem element. You can do Wrath of Air and Tranquil Air. You can do Mana Spring and Poison Cleansing Totem, so on and so forth. Basically, as a Elemental Shaman, you shouldn't have to worry about totem twisting as much, but as Eek said, it's not really twisting as we think as Wind Fury into Grace of Air or Wind Fury into Tranquil Air. As an Elemental Shaman, you shouldn't be in a melee group unless you're in a five man or a ten man but if you're in a 25 man raid totem twisting can be extended to the thought of using different totems of the same element type for certain situations if there's an aoe pulse poison you want to remove your mana spring and put that on poison cleansing or let's say that there's an aoe disease of course you want to make sure that you're swapping your disease cleansing totem and to replace whatever water totem you were using before Let's break down useful totems by element. We'll begin with our earth totems. It's unlikely that you're going to get much mileage out of an earth totem in a caster or healer group. However, it is important to understand what your totems do. Strength of Earth Totem is a melee buff totem. Tremor Totem is an important totem to use during a boss encounter that has fear, charm, or sleep mechanics. Earthbind Totem can be a useful tool in kiting and running from loose trash in an instance or raid. Stoneclaw Totem is a useful totem to drop before Earthbind in order to take loose mobs off your tail. And Stoneskin Totem, which is not a relatively worthwhile totem, but could be useful if you're down in a caster group expecting to take a little bit of melee damage. However, in Tier 6, running two-piece Tier 6, you will gain 15 MP5, 35 crit rating, and 45 spell power when all four totems of your elements are down. In this situation, make sure to have one of these totems down at all times in order to receive this benefit from tier 6. On to our fire totems. We'll begin with Totem of Wrath, which is our mandatory 100% uptime on bosses totem. This totem provides 3% hit and 3% spell crit to all your party members. Your fellow raiders will make gear decisions around Totem of Wrath and will come at a great detriment to your party members' DPS if you do not drop or fail to keep this crucial totem in range. Fire Elemental Totem is useful off CD on trash. Frost Resistance Totem is beneficial if you are in a healer or ranged DPS group during an encounter with frost damage. Searing totem should really never be used in raids as totem of wrath or your aoe fire totems will be far more valuable to you fire nova totem has a niche addition to dps on ads or trash and magma totem is a supplementary niche addition to ads or trash dps should you have the mana for your air totems we have wrath of air to start which is a required 100 uptime totem while in a caster or healer group wind fury totem which is a totem that you will unlikely use as you should not be in a melee party if you are for whatever reason then you should have this down 100 of the time grace of air totem is a nice additional buff if you are in a hunter or or ranged DPS group. However, that should be taken care of by a Resto or Enhancement Shaman. Nature Resistance Totem, which is a very beneficial totem for fights involving high amounts of nature damage. These are few and far between in TBC, but keep this totem in mind. Tranquil Air Totem, optimal while in a group where overthreading the tank is an issue. This could be in your Pumper Caster group with your Destro Locks and Arcane Fire Mages. And Grounding Totem, which is useful for redirecting ranged attacks from susceptible mobs and bosses. This is also a crucial PvP ability. Finally, under the Water Totem category, we have Mana Spring Totem, which should generally be down 100% of the time. An exception here is when fire resist is required or if debuff cleansing is required. Poison cleansing totem is mandatory when there's high poison output. Fire resistance totem, beneficial for fights involving high fire damage. Think Kael'thas. Healing stream totem, useful if there are two shaman in one caster DPS or healer group, or if mana is not a consideration for you or other party members in your group. And disease cleansing totem, which is mandatory on encounters with high disease output and has nominal usage throughout TBC. We'll move on now to add-ons and UI. A solid UI is crucial in adapting quickly to fluid raid environments. It is equally important to have both a clean and clear drama for UI, as well as a focally centered UI on your screen, while maintaining an unobstructed view of the encounter. As a shaman with off-healing potential, I would recommend running unit frames to display your raid and party members. These frame options are things like Grid 2, LVI, Luna, Voodoo, Pitbull, etc. 
As you can see in the image linked of my UI, I have a very minimalist UI comprised of very few elements that allow me to track important spells and cooldowns. Even though I'm an elemental shaman, I recognize the comparative strength of my off healing potential relative to that of other classes. Elemental shaman don't have to drop form, and this makes us a very competitive spot healer. Keep in mind that you are a class that has access to both damaging and healing spells, and that if players are dying or healers have fallen, that it is your job to pick up the slack. While discussion regarding UI is subjective, there are some add-ons that I would heavily recommend having. Weak auras being chief among them. You can use weak auras to track literally any ability and aura in the game, and the better you are creating weak auras will literally translate directly into you being better as a player. In addition, if you're going to be using heals, as you should, to spot any healing, you should get click or a mouse over macro. To further supplement, you can get totem timers, details, bartender, big wigs, omni CC, enemy casting bar, or item rack for gear swapping between encounters. This brings us to keybinding, which, along with the proper UI, can greatly improve player reaction time and decrease wasted time when utilizing abilities. Keybinds also allow the player to subconsciously react to situations with muscle memory if they have formatted their keybindings well. When keybinding, keep this general picture in mind. The gray keys signify movement and utility keys, the green signify keys that you can reach quickly, orange signify keys that are slightly less efficient than green, and red signifies keys that are incredibly hard to hit with any precision. You may have noticed that Q and E, or either A and D, are not rebound to be functional keybindings, this is because I don't believe in removing functionality from the game. However, if you are an experienced PvPer or have played with this keybind schema in the future, you may opt to use these keybindings. The next two slides go over which abilities we believe you should keybind and have access to at all times. So you can scroll through your leisure, but basically none of these should be a surprise to you. All of your damaging spells, your water shield, your potions cooldowns, your CDs, trinket slots, racials, totemic recall, all these things should be keybound. And on this slide, we're talking about the totems. All the totems here should be bound. You're going to use them more more than once throughout your entire PvE experience in TBC Classic. So therefore, you should have them bound and you should know those binds in case you have to use them. Another thing that should improve your ability to play the game, as well as other classes, is to develop a binding schema. Examples of this are R is always an interrupt of some kind, tilde a purge or dispel, V always a racial, and C a PvP trinket, etc. Obviously only you know what works best for you, but try to build out a similar scheme for yourself to avoid confusion and increase your ability to play across classes without confusing your muscle memory and adjusting and readjusting your keybinds. Check out this video to help you build your own binding scheme, and the link will be in the description below. The second to last thing that we're going to cover is group strategy. In TBC you're most likely only going to experience two versions of the same group, which is the caster DPS group. However, you may encounter in your travels a melee or healer group. In this section, we'll discuss your positioning and totem usage while in each of these groups. The first group is the pumper caster group and the most traditional and ideal group assignment in TBC for an elemental shaman. The benefits of this group may be that you receive a boomkin for extra crit and or a spreest for extra mana regen. These perks are really for the big pumper arcane mages and destra locks, but you will be there incidentally for your totem of wrath. The spreest may be taken from this group and given to group five if damage is insane. However, your goal should always be to be the best elemental shaman in your raid to secure your spot in this group. Having a spreest will generally remove all mana concerns from your play, and having a boomkin is just icing on an already delicious cake. If you are lucky enough to be in this group, your positioning and totem setup will be as follows. Your position near your assigned casters, your air totem, Wrath of Air or Tranquil Air Totem, depending on threat. Earth Totem, Dealer's Choice, which is not important until Tier 6 2-piece. Your Water Totem should be Mana Spring Totem. And your Fire Totem is Totem of Wrath. The second most common group, and the runner-up group to the Pumper Caster group, is the Simple Caster group. The benefits of this group are very similar to the Pumper group, however, you will likely not have access to a Spreest, and may or may not have access to a Boomkin either. While this group is definitely for the bastard stepchildren casters of the raid, it is still a solid place to be. If you are in the runner-up Shaman group, your positioning is in range near your assigned group. Your Air Totem will be Wrath of Air or Tranquil Air, depending on threat. Your Earth Totem will be Dealer's Choice, which is not important until Tier 6 2-piece. Your Water Totem will be Mana Spring, and your Fire Totem will be Totem of Wrath. The third group type, which is an unlikely group type, is the melee group. And if you are in a melee group, someone probably hates you, or you're running less than an optimal number of Shaman. Other than G-quitting this guild, while in this raid position, your totem setup will be as follows. Your positioning will be in the melee cluster, or very close to your assigned group. Your air totem will be Wind Fury to GOA Twisting, or, or Tranquil Air Twisting, depending on threat. Your earth totem will be Strength of Earth. Your water totem, Mana Spring, or Healing Stream if steady damage is occurring and your fire totem will be for your benefit and be totem of wrath. The final group type is the group 5 healer group. This group is a bit of a head scratcher, but nothing really bad is happening here in this group for you. This is typically the healer group, and if you're here it's because your raid has a surplus of DPS shaman and you are the worst elemental. Nothing changes in this group compared to a caster group, except it will be very unlikely that you will see a spreest or a boomkin. You will however get to hang out with the healers and develop a relationship with them. This relationship might save your life from time to time, so do your best to make the healers like you. In group 5, your positioning and totem setup will be as follows. Your positioning will be in the Ranged near your assigned group, your air totem will be Wrath of Air, Earth totem will be Dealer's Choice, which is not important until tier 6 2-piece, your 
water totem will be mana spring and your fire totem will be totem of wrath right, we're going to briefly go over threat here threat is not a huge thing to go over as an elemental shaman as it is an enhancement and restoration but it's important to keep in mind that every point of damage generates one point of threat attributed to you on the threat table of any enemy you hit the only thing that's different from that is frost shock which you should not be using so don't worry about that therefore you should, if you're using chain lightning you should be careful that you don't get threat on a unit that the tank hasn't hit yet so if there's a either a trash pack or a boss encounter where there's more than one boss if you hit that chain lightning and it hits a second target before a tank has hit it you're going to be top on the threat table so be very careful when you and chain lightning there is a higher chance to pull aggro in tbc classic compared to vanilla classic and that's primarily because the fact that tanks are not dual wielding if they're warriors and are not world buff it severely limits tanks threat potentials and because of this the propensity to get aggro on pull or even rip aggro from tanks or dps is slightly higher compared to vanilla classic be wary of initial aggro on pulls and keep an eye out on your threat meter additionally always be outside of melee range if possible as you require 130 percent of the tank's current threat to pull off them compared to 110 percent if you're in melee range. TLDR here is just watch your threat meter as you should always be doing as a DPS in any version of World of Warcraft. Recap for the Elemental Shaman PvE guide, guys. There's no which spell and rotation to use for every circumstance. He spent a lot of time mathing out the rotations, how they work, the benefit of using a certain rotation over, over another. You should look at your spell power, your critical strike rating, how much haste you have, and be knowledgeable what rotation is best for you and your guild and the encounter time that you are currently in. Use your cooldowns and totems effectively. You should always have your totems down especially the ones that benefit you and other party members and you should not miss a cooldown like elemental mastery or use a potion cooldown at the wrong time because therefore you might go oom or have to use a less effective damaging rotation make sure to play to your strengths if you know that you're good at certain things if you know you're a good off healer make sure you're looking at your raid frames to help healers if they need help otherwise if you're just really good at pressing two buttons then be the best elemental shaman you can remember our dps is not as high as warlocks and hunters especially later in the game so your benefits and your reason for coming to the raid lie within the benefits you provide to others so just make sure you remember that you should be both reactive and preemptive at the same time this seems impossible to do but you should know the mechanics that are coming out so you can plan to move or perhaps provide an off heal and be reactive as well when you see a mechanic is put down on the ground move out of it as fast as you possibly can being preemptive and knowledgeable of the mechanics that are coming but also reactive the mechanics that already happened is the key to being a good player the ui and keybinds are just as important as your gear and consumables and spells you may be a very talented player but if your ui and keybinds are not good and if they don't provide a clear not obstructed view of the encounter you could be gimping your performance significantly choose a profession path that works best for you we've outlined many different profession paths you can take we've also outlined some very try hard ones if you can't afford the try hard ones or you don't want to do it then don't pick the profession path that provides you the most benefit while allowing you to play the game how, the, how you want to be played just keep in mind that there are certain professions much better than others depending on the phase of the current content and finally there are several pieces of gear that will be helpful for vanilla classic if you have access to those raids now you should get as many of them as you can to help your leveling and to ease your period bis gearing well ladies and gents we've done it we've gotten to the end of the tbc classic elemental shaman pve guide if you're hungry for more shaman content content outside of the stuff we've already referenced in this guide itself i have a ton of guides on both vanilla classic and tbc era shaman egan i have also put out a tbc classic resto shaman guide and eben another member of the classic shaman discord and myself have put out the tbc classic enhancement shaman guide in addition to that i've created the tbc classic advanced shaman guide which is a three-hour guide that goes over all available theory craft for shaman in tbc classic a version two of the guide with updates from an actual client will be released once i have access to tbc classic I will link all relevant shaman guides in the description below, as well as my classic shaman video playlist, which has all of my shaman videos in it. In addition to that, I'm also part of Classic Wild Live, which is a home for guides for TBC Classic and Vanilla Classic, and the guides I've referenced in this video are also on that site, as well as our other amazing TBC Classic and Vanilla Classic guides. Check out Classic Wild Live for your classic World of Warcraft guide needs. And finally, as I stated before, the Classic Shaman Discord. If you weren't around for the beginning of the guide, Egregious and I are both the co-founders of the Classic Shaman Discord. Discord, and it is a multifaceted collaborative home for all shaman regardless of the expansion we're talking about or the spec you're playing a link to the classic shaman discord will be in the description below and once you click on that link you'll have access to the readme channel and if you react to the top posts with the expansion you'd like to see it'll open that part of the discord so for example if you're interested in tbc classic which you probably are since you're watching this video if you react to that emoji you'll have access to the tbc classic portion of the classic shaman discord however you also might be interested in classic vanilla and if you click on that emoji you'll have access to the classic vanilla portion 
portion of the Classic Shaman Discord. When you get a chance, come on over to the Classic Shaman Discord and drop below to both myself and Egregious if you'd like. Lastly, if you enjoy the type of content I create, consider liking the video and drop a subscribe if you'd like to be updated on any new Classic Vanilla or Classic TBC guides or content. Thanks for watching this guide, have a great day, keep on keybinding and grinding, and peace my Shaman brothers and sisters, may the ancestors be with you.